All right. Hello, hello, and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so, so very much for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Joseph Rogers. I am the manager of partnerships and community engagement here at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. And for those of you who know me, that is practice and rehearse because it's a long title, right? <laughs> but it's also a very important one because you are part of this community. And as we want to engage more with you, we wanna make sure that all of the voices that represent both Richmond and Virginia are represented here. And so this particular conversation today helps us do that. We get to explore uh, some of the legacies of uh, the living legacies of our city, as well as those who are exploring these for, in some cases, the very first time. Now, this conversation is extraordinarily important because of all of that and because you are all here to help join in with it. Those people who are hearing about the story of Mary Lumpkin for the very first time, and for those of you who have heard this story and grew up with it, as many of the community have. So being able to share this experience together is essential. And I thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us today. Um, now, a couple of the additional housekeeping items that we have here. These are a part of uh, uh, our new initiatives and engagements. And as we do so, we also encourage you to attend ad additional events, uh, including uh, in two weeks around the same time, we're going to have another one uh, with Mallory No Pain from Radio IQ and Michael Paul Williams uh, with the Richmond Times Dispatch uh, doing a live show of their podcast, Memory Wars, exploring uh, myths from two sides of the Atlantic. And so we invite you to return uh, on the 29th uh, to join us for that as well. But without further ado, I would like to uh, call to the stage and bring up our speakers today, our discussion givers. Um, and that is uh, both Kristen Green and Dr. Kara uh, Livia Heron. Uh, Kristen Green is a reporter and author of The Devil's Half Acre and a New York Times bestseller of Something Must Be Done About Prince Edward County. She has worked as a journalist for two decades for newspapers including the Boston Globe, the San Diego Union Tribune, and the Richmond Times Dispatch. Uh, she holds a master's in public administration from the Harvard Kennedy School and lives in Richmond with her husband and two daughters. Uh, Dr. Carol Livia Haran is an African-American Jewish author, educator, and publisher living in Washington, D.C. She received her Ph.D. in comparative literature from the University of Pennsylvania and has held multiple professor professorial appointments, including at Harvard and the College of William and Mary. Now, currently, she teaches classics in the English Department of Howard University and has recently been commissioned to write a play about her ancestry the ancestry that we will hear about tonight. So two of her children's books, Nappy Hair and Always and Olivia, highlight her Virginia heritage. And Cara Olivia Heron is a descendant of the woman that, uh, uh, that Kristen Green wrote about, Mary Lumpkin. So without further ado, let's invite them both onto the stage. everybody for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. It means so much that you're all here. And I'm super excited to share <laughs> Dr. Haran with all of you for her first time speaking publicly here in Richmond. Um, thank you, Joseph, so much for the nice introduction and for organizing this for us. Um, thank you to the museum and your staff for allowing us to have this event and for promoting it. And thank you to all of you for coming out tonight. I'm just really thrilled to be able to have this conversation. I think you're gonna just love meeting Dr. Haran. And you. <laughs> <laughs> Since I first learned about Mary Lumpkin 11 years ago, I haven't been able to put her out of my mind. She was described in just a couple of sentences in Smithsonian Magazine article as a woman who quote acted 
as a wife of a Shaco bottom slave owner, slave jail owner, Robert Lumpkin, and was the mother of his children. For years, while I worked on another book, my first book, my thoughts returned to her. I wonder what it meant to be in her position, living in a jail, mothering children she did not consent to have, with a man she did not choose, a man known for his brutality and his disregard for black lives. I wondered what it meant to be protected in some ways from the evils of slavery and to have a role in the business of slavery while watching other enslaved people come through the jail every day. I thought about how she had found the agency to educate and free her children. I thought about how she had inherited the jail and had turned it into a school for free black men and how remarkable all of those things were. And I wondered why her important story had not been told and why I knew so little about the lives of most enslaved women. While growing up, I only learned about enslaved women who ran away, enslaved women who seized their freedom, like Harriet Tubman, women who were certainly the exception since most enslaved women could not would not leave their children. For years, I found myself regularly returning to Mary Lumpkin and my questions about her life. And I decided in 2014 to pursue telling her story as a book. Now, all these years later, it's fun to think that two hours up I-95, Dr. Haran, a Washington DC college professor and author, was also thinking about Mary Lumpkin. She had been thinking about her ever since she first learned about her ancestor when she was nine years old. To find information about Mary Lumpkin's life, I used all my reporting tools to uncover more details. I sifted through crumbling court papers and searched old newspapers. I studied US census records, marriage documents, and death records. I read slave narratives, filling myself with stories of other enslaved women's experiences. I traveled to the places that she lived and sent her children to be educated. I went to Ipswich, Massachusetts, so I could look at old school records, to Philadelphia, to look at property records, to Ohio, to see the steep hillside where she was buried. Mary Lumpkin was born enslaved in 1832, described as, quote, nearly white and, quote, fair-faced. She may have been the daughter of an enslaved woman and her enslaver, his relative, or an overseer. She was likely sold away from some or all of her family as a young child, perhaps by the time she was eight years old when census records show that Robert Lumpkin was in possession of an enslaved child. 27 years her senior, Robert Lumpkin likely got his start in the slave trade as an itinerant salesman selling goods from the back of a wagon when he noticed scrappy young men crisscrossing the state, buying up enslaved people on courthouse steps in taverns and from farmers who needed cash and then reselling them for profit. After the transatlantic slave trade was abolished on January 1st, 1808, the domestic or downriver slave trade from the upper south to the lower south thrived and became more fully developed, creating demand for safe holding cells for enslaved people before and after sale. Richmond developed into the second biggest port city for domestic slave sales after New Orleans, and in 1840, Virginia was responsible for shipping about half of all enslaved people sold across state lines. By 1844, but perhaps earlier, Robert Lumpkin was operating the slave jail that had been constructed in 1830 and was considered one of the most prominent features of the city. The 41 foot jail facility held over hundred people and sat at the center of the plot, which was surrounded by tall fences and tracking dogs. A two-story brick house faced the street, and the property also had a large boarding house or a hotel for visiting enslavers and slave traders that also had an auction house 
and a kitchen or bar to prepare them food and drinks. In addition to providing this lodging for both enslaved people and for their enslavers, Robert Lumpkin punished enslaved people for a fee. There were iron rings on the floor of the jail where enslaved people, even children, would be chained down and flogged by an overseer. In that space, Mary Lumpkin managed to build a life for her children. We know because of the oral history that Dr. Heron has carried for more than six decades, that Mary Lumpkin negotiated with Robert Lumpkin on behalf of her children. We know that she told him, you can do what you want with me, but quote, these children have to be free. Dr. Heron and I were introduced at an inopportune time in the project. <laughs> I mean, I was thrilled to meet her, but I wished it could have been a little bit earlier. <laughs> Not only had the manuscript been edited, the words were typewritten on the page, <laughs> which meant nothing could be added unless, this is what I negotiated, it was replacing something already there and the word count had to match perfectly. <laughs> so Dr. Haran and I got to know each other really quickly. <laughs> I had talked with other descendants and they knew nothing of Mary Lumpkin. These relatives who lived on the West Coast were descended from Mary's oldest daughter. They had never been told anything about her story. They didn't know that they had an ancestor who had been enslaved. They didn't know that her daughter was born to a slave trader. But meeting Dr. Haran was a different experience. Someone as passionate about the story as I was, and arguably more passionate since it's her own family. Someone who was connected by blood to the story, someone who could fill holes. She knew things passed down via oral history that I never would have learned on my own. She told me stories that weren't in books and weren't in public documents about how Mary Lumpkin survived and provided for her children. Our work together reminds me that while this history has been hidden since the jail building was knocked down in 1888, it is still very much alive. Our work to learn more about her family line reminds me that this story is not finished. There is still more to uncover and more to learn in some ways. This book that looks very much like a book <laughs> and very finished is really just a draft of this history. It is my distinct honor to appear with Dr. Haran here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Haran, tell us why you're wearing your shaker bracelet. Okay. Yes, I, I'm going to explain it and then take it off so it won't disturb you the whole time. But <laughs> I've been following this story since I was nine years old. I'll go into more details in a moment. And with the publication of Kristen's book in April, April 12th of this year, I went to the House of Musical Traditions in Tacoma Park and bought this as, to, as a way of expressing my rage at my slave owning ancestors. But my sense that the story, at least the, the beginning, the, the foundation of the whole story is there for everyone now. And I thank Kristen for the work she did very much. So I don't think I could have born to, to write it. I, I appreciate what you've done. And this is, rather than hurt somebody, I do this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell us the story about being a nine-year-old girl and learning about this ancestor. Well, you, and, and you told me that you somehow knew that you were supposed yes. to hold on to this. Tell and, us that story. And it came from Louisa May Alcott's Little Women. Would you believe it? I said, <laughs> no, no. When I read Little Women and the other stories related to that, I realized that, that Louisa May Alcott had, had listened to her family and so forth and created a story out of it. And I said, well, I'm going to do that one day. And for some reason, I knew not to ask directly. I don't know why, but I knew. But I said, one day somebody's going to start talking about my story, and I want to listen real hard, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to remember it so hard. And I promised myself, like, like at five, six, seven, eight years old, that I would remember the story so that when I got old, I could write it down. 
Well, I fell asleep one day on, in my grandmother's house, Kenilworth, Washington, D.C., and sound asleep, supposedly. My aunt Rowena came in and thought I was asleep. She had three or four of her friends with her, and she told the story to her friends, a story that no one would tell to a nine-year-old. I, I hope nobody would tell directly. And I heard the story and pretended to be asleep. And here is basically a story that we are descended from, we call, we call her the first Rowena. She was named after her grandmother, Rowena, who was married to a man calling himself George Washeka Lumpkins, but who was actually one of the children of, it's hard, it's hard for me to accept Robert as my ancestor, you can understand, but of, of, of Marianne Lumpkin and of Robert Lumpkin. And she was telling the story of this cruel man who was not kind to his children. If you go to Wikipedia or something, it's, oh, he was, he was mean to black people in general and, and enslaved people in general, but nice to his children. Well, that's not what my aunt was saying. They, they called him cruel, they called him awful. They said, they said he, wasn't, he didn't have a plantation, she said. And I'm sorry, most of the story comes to me in very strong fragments. He, but he did some job that helped other slave owners. And he had a slave who was forced to have his children and, and he wanted to hurt the children or enslave the children and that the, the mother insisted that if you want me, you gotta keep my children free. Uh, my aunt Rowena said that, that she was able to negotiate with him in some kind of way so that two of the children were sent to New Orleans, two were sent to Ohio and one to Massachusetts. Now, I, uh, and, and in retrospect, my interpretation is that the ones who went to Ohio and New Orleans were white skinned so that they could, they could pass. And the one who went to Massachusetts was the dark one. And I am descended from the Massachusetts one. I know I'm jumping all over the story. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> so uh, as we go through the evening, uh, I'll try to fill in more. My aunt said a lot more. She said, why is it this, the story kept talking about, uh, she knew what happened to the girls, but she wanted to know what happened to the boys. She wondered why this man was so cruel. And essentially she ascribed the power that Mary Ann had over Robert to, to sexual power. It was sexual power. And, and I think one, one reason for the story being kept silent is people are embarrassed to talk about that kind of power, and especially in, across races and so forth and so on. And that's a part of it. And, and quite frankly, I'm happy for you to ask these particular questions. I, I, I've told the story enough. I, I don't know whether I've left out something important from that first time. But from that moment, I knew I was onto something. I didn't have the exact name Mary Ann Lumpkins at the time. That, that I had to piece together. But the Lumpkins part of the family were from Massachusetts. And, and the, my grandmother and her four siblings uh, were born in Massachusetts. My grandmother and, and her sisters moved to Washington, D.C. around 1905. They lived among the Wampanoag people of Massachusetts. And, and consider themselves, still consider ourselves members of the Wampanoag Nation. We have no direct historical proof of that. But if any of you saw the picture of my grandmother, you would think it, it, it came from the Smithsonian African, uh, excuse me, Smithsonian American Art Museum, the section on Native Americans. There's no doubt in my mind. So, so that's something we're still filling in, but I'm, I don't want to get away from the story. But so this going on to it, how I piece together everything. I, my aunt described the walk from the slave ship up some hills to Richmond. And it gave you chills all over me. I remember lying there thinking, and oh, 20, I'm jumping around, but 2014, I was asked to give a talk about nappy hair. Next door is it at the Fine Arts Museum? And somebody, after I gave my talk, somebody said, you want to take a tour? Sure. So they took me to, to the Devil's Half Acre. And when I went there, I pieced together my aunt's description of that walk up the hill, that slave trail, and some things that my Uncle George from Massachusetts had told me. 
pieces and fragments of things that my mother and other aunts had told me. And I knew that the Mary Ann that my uncle George told me about in Massachusetts was the same Mary Ann that was a, was partnered with Robert Lumpkins. And and I, I, I uh, as you'll read in this book, you, you captured it. I, I flung myself down on the ground and on the devil's half acre because uh, I felt that my ancestors, some of my ancestors were there. And I was like whispering to them, I, I'm here. I survived. I came back. And your story will not be lost. We're going to tell this story. We're going to find a way to tell the story. It's well before I knew, Kristen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I really liked the specific part of the story as a nine-year-old when you you talked about her agency. Can you tell us a little bit about that? About you remember learning as a nine-year-old that yeah. that she had. She had agency. Yes, yes. I I was shocked. I was invited somehow last year. I, I came down to Richmond, Virginia. I was invited down by another group of folks who were writing doing a film on on Mary Lumpkin, and they were talking about her in the in the film as they were recording, as if he was a nice guy. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. That, that's exaggerating. They were they, they didn't they hated his guts too. Uh, don't let me exaggerate. <laughs> but but. What I'm saying is that 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 uh, it, it sounded too nice from what I had heard, and I I kept interrupting them, and they were like, "No, that didn't happen. That's not what my aunt didn't say. That my aunt said that he was mean. Yes. My aunt said that he was cruel. <laughs> my aunt said he hurt the children, and that she and 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 that, and that Mary Ann herself insisted and put herself in between." and stopped some of the things he was going to do to the children. And I, I realized I was nine years old when I heard this, so I didn't understand all the words, but I knew he was talking about something cruel. He was talking about rape, talking about awful things happening to it. And I didn't understand all of it, but I, I knew that it was something really terrible and that she gained some power over him in, in spite of having no official power, no legal power, that she had power. And she used it, and you will save my children. You can do anything you want with me. I can remember my aunt said, "You can do anything you want with me." And and she she was a, she had some details that I didn't understand, but I think I wouldn't speak out even if I didn't understand. <laughs> so, but you better not touch my children. Hmm. And uh, she demanded money from him. She got money from him. She put the children on trains and sent them different places: uh, Massachusetts, Ohio, and New Orleans are the only ones I heard about. You you know you learned about more than mm -hmm. I, I don't know about the Pennsylvania group. But let me tell you, how did this all come out? How did the two the two branches of the family get connected? Because I never I never had any connection with the ones that went to Ohio and everywhere. I was went to a restaurant, a soup store on Kennedy Street in Washington D.C. and I was sitting there eating my bowl of soup in the midst of COVID, by the way, and and somebody in the next table starts talking about Marianne Lumpkin. I'm like, they don't even look black. What are they talking about? My, <laughs> they don't even talk about my ancestor, my great great grandmother. I said, why are you talking about my great great grandmother? And they go like, what? Said, my great great grandmother, Marianne Lumpkin. That's my that's my family. And they said, we've been looking for you. We've been looking for you. You know. Love and it. they're the ones who invited me to Richmond. And then the Richmond, um, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting everybody's name. You won't help me with names if I need it. But, but uh, some, I wonder, Ben Campbell. Campbell, mm -hmm. Reverend Campbell was there. Uh, uh, Reverend Turner was there. And they said, well, do you, do you know about Kristen Green? She's writing a book. Said, no, I never heard of her before. <laughs> <laughs> but look at this talk about saving Virginia. When I think about, forgive me, this little white kid, <laughs> stuck stuck in a county that doesn't allow her to, to go to school with black people and they think they're going to stop her from doing something good in the world if that's what happens when you segregate people right on this is let it let it happen so that, what, a, what a response and and so we so we met so we met through this accidental bowl of soup and, and before this is all over we have to go to that Yes. Places have some soup 
we should. And and anyway, so so that's how I, I, I'm all out of order. But. Well, I feel like we should try to make it a little more clear for Thank people you. how how you were descended Please. from Mary Lumpkin. So the reason that I couldn't find Dr. Well, there are a lot of reasons I couldn't have found her on my own, but I was able to find some of Mary Lumpkin's descendants through um, research like Ancestry.com, right through um, documents, but. So I was able to trace her her firstborn daughter and her second child, who was also a daughter. I was able to trace them pretty well. Well, at least one. So the firstborn daughter, one of her children, I was able to trace, right? And that's how I found all these white descendants who live on the West Coast. And then the second daughter had two children and they both died. So they, like I had, you know, I felt like I had kind of done everything I could with those um, two children. But the three sons, Robert, Richard, and John, okay. just couldn't be found. I mean, I like COVID did like happen while I was still working on this. And so I'll never know if like there are, or maybe I will know, maybe I'll keep working on this the rest of my life. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but um, like, I don't know if maybe there is a death record somewhere that I couldn't find because um, I couldn't go places during COVID. But the three sons really just disappeared. Um, and so, you know, a good guess is that they changed their names or they moved away or both, right? I mean, I think that a lot of um, Black people who were able to pass changed their names and, and assumed new identities and moved away. So I couldn't find descendants for them. Um, but Dr. Haran and I were able to look at her, you know, I was able to use her family tree to trace her pretty far back to the the relative George that she's talking about, mm -hmm. who we believe is Richard, Richard, Richard. the middle son, uh, based on Richard's timeline. Um, and so I think that's that's something we both are like really excited about continuing to pursue and mm -hmm. seeing if we can find more, you know, solid proof that that's true, what his life looked like. Can you tell us, so, okay, so Mary's son, Richard, is your great, great, grandfather correct yes that's right and then um and then where are you descended from there george and george married the first rowena we call her rowena nelson lumpkins and um, rowena nelson was came from the nelson plantation in virginia and is considered to be a relative of the nelson family that owned her and many of you may know that Thomas Nelson Jr. signed the Declaration of Independence. So if that's so, I'm a daughter of the American Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I, I bring her out because even though she's not in the direct line, she was a great influence on the psychological perceptions of the family. She it was she she hated slavery. And, and the desire for whiteness is with such passion. And she married George uh, and George himself. I, uh, that, I'm sorry, there, there's three Georges. The, late, the last George told me these stories. I always, I never met this George. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, when I asked my uncle George in Massachusetts, why he had the strange name Washeka is his middle name, George Washeka Lumpkins. And he wouldn't tell me, and he said, I, well, he came from Canada, and then he said he came from the Inuits, and he came from the, you know, he said all kinds of, but he he wouldn't tell me exactly what it was, it was clear he didn't want to tell the story. And of course, I was the, I was the kid who asked all those questions, you know, I'm the one, every, everybody else would go play in the yard, and I was like, well, tell me about this. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he's the one, and I, I will remember this to my dying day, when, I, when he said, well, you know, we changed our name meaning all three of the Georges. Well, you know, and when he said, when you know that part of it, it was clear that he thought I didn't know. He thought I knew, I didn't. But he saw from my face that I didn't know. He made this gesture with his hand. And I can still see it because there, there was an apple tree behind him and, it, and the apples were on him. He's like, it's a gesture. Like, I, I'm not speaking anymore about it. You know, we changed our name. Just to take off from there back to nine years old, my, and, and what Kristen just said, my aunt Rowena also said, why is it the boys disappeared in the family? It's like it's a family that had only girls. Did they murder the boys? Did they, did they sell the boys into slavery? 
she she was just guessing. We, we don't have any proof of that. And and uh, and so so my but my uncle said another thing. Um, I just asked. He he was Catholic, and the rest of the family was not Catholic. So so I asked him, did he name his daughter Mary, Mary because he was Catholic and he was honoring the Virgin Mary? And he says no. I named her for my grandma, great grandmother, and that's where I, that's what I connected the Mary name from to, to 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 the same story my aunt Rowena told me. And I have to say that also there were times when my aunt Rowena uh, called me um, Mary Ann. She called me Mary Ann, and and that uh, I never understood that it was a nickname she used for me. I even. I asked her why she called me that, and she didn't. She never told me. She was the oldest sibling, the only one who actually knew the second Moema of the of my mother's siblings. And anyway, I, I think I've said enough. But 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 uh, <laughs> but but George, uh, the the Washeka, I was able to trace. I'm sorry about but the Washeka. It's, it's it is a name that comes from Virginia, uh, a Native American name. But it's, but another form of it is is in the Wampanoag people. Of Massachusetts, and it looks like, it looks like to me, you made up a name that that was something like George Washington, George Washeka, George Washington. I think I I'm saying that, and I'm a novelist, so forgive me. I'm not trying to be as perfect as you are with the facts, but I but you know there was a tendency. I'm, I'm sure some of you know the the lot of you know, George Washington Carver. You know there there was a lot of use use of of, of names of, of white heroes. Shall we say that? Um, for black people. And one theory is that the Wampanoag people um, took in enslaved people who mm. were fleeing, right? Yes. And there's no doubt that they lived among the Wampanoag, by the way. That's that's no doubt. The, 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 the question is is the DNA, um, the Wampanoag DNA. And that's something that I'm very much concerned about. Indeed, I've already been investigating with, with, with Mr. Mr. Joseph over here and trying to find out some more details about that. But that's why he might have adopted that name is yes. that he, that he was taken in by, by the, Wampanoag people. Yes. And and wasn't Rowena senior the, the the first George's wife Rowena mm -hmm. was wasn't she living among the Wampanoag people yes. as well? Oh, yeah, and she was formerly enslaved. Yeah, but like she had her, she she had all of her children including my grandmother Lucy were born on Wampanoag Street in Bridgewater, Massachusetts. Yeah. So Lucy was the child of we were going down the line, so we've Lucy? got so oh, we have oh, I'm sorry. Thank Mary, you. then George, Richard, George, and then I, we have George, George, and then George, the next, the, the first George, not the third. This the, <laughs> Mary, I'm, I'm sorry, Ma uh, Mary, George, George, and I'm switching to Lucy. There is another George that stays in Massachusetts, <laughs> but Lucy comes to Washington. Okay, so there's see. Lucy, your grandmother, Lucy, my grandmother, and then my mother, Georgia. Uh, and on down. Yeah. So and I'm go. here. I'm currently here. <laughs> <laughs> so when we met for the first time in person a few months ago, we did a bookstore talk in Alexandria, and I was describing this um, decision by Robert Lumpkin to move his children north as, as you mentioned earlier, as evidence that he cared for them um, and that he cared for Mary Lumpkin. And I, <laughs> I realize now I did exactly what I write about in the book, right? That white people trying to romanticize these relationships, right? Um, trying to make them less bad, trying to sanitize them. Um, and you, you mentioned that you don't agree that he loved the children. Can you tell us a little bit more about why you think he chose to educate and protect them and to let Mary be free? And you see, I would use different words and I'm only, obviously it was passed down to me. It's not impossible for a slave owner to love his children, obviously. But I'm only saying, this is not what I heard from my aunt. That's, that's all I mean by that. And and I would, I would put it this way. He did not love his children. He did not decide to educate his children. He, had decided, he allowed his wife, partner, concubine, slave to educate their children. That's, that's just, a, just a slight change in mm -hmm. terminology. It's not like he said, okay, I mean, let me educate my child. It's like, if you demand this money to educate this child, here's the money, as long as I've got you, your body. Why do you think he let her leave? 
I mean, and you know that she came back. So what do you yeah. what do you make of that? I think she made a, a, a promise to him that she would that what she, what I just said that that I he she said to him that this is only what I believe, not a fact that I know, of course. I am yours forever, eternally, as long as my children are unhurt. And he believed it. And that, I think that was the, the deal. What else can I say? I, 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 can't, I can't see any other way. And I'm also interpreting the tone of my aunt's voice, if I may. That's how it sounded. So what may have been perceived as love of the children may have been attachment, sick or, or healthy to the, to the woman. Interesting. I mentioned that prior to learning about your existence, I had only found white descendants of Mary Lumpkin, um, descendants whose, whose family had lived as white for generations on the West Coast and knew nothing of her story. Um, so passing, we know, was pretty common for light-skinned mixed people, but you told me that your family consciously made another decision. Can That's you talk right. about that? Yes, uh, we, we touched on it a little bit when I say I, I like to bring in the wife of, well, I'll call him George, even though the name is Richard you know, in, 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 the, in the record. Uh, the, the wife, Rowena, the first Rowena, uh, evidently did not know she was enslaved at the beginning. She was treated, educated on the Nelson plantation well before she met her husband. They were married later on. And when she discovered she was enslaved and discovered all the horrors, she rebelled against the slave system and, and the, the love of white skin, as it were, so greatly that she said, I'm going to marry the blackest man I can find. <laughs> And she not only did, and I have a feeling, I like her strength and power, but I don't think I would have liked her. <laughs> she, she sounds like she was pretty much in charge of the family. My, and this is a story that doesn't come from, from the, the second Rowena, but from my grandmother, Lucy. My grandmother, Lucy, told me, she said she had three men asked her to marry, get married. And there were three different shades of black, brown, and, and white. She said, you married a black one. Yeah, and, and, my, and my grandmother, Lucy, married the black one which is where I got my nappy hair. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And people, people still sometimes tease me about my nappy hair. Yeah, but it's still paying the bills. It's still so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I have to say the last line about, about that. Oh, yeah. It's, it's not her line, but the one I, I made up about her. She says, from white to black in three generations. She says, she's going to black in this family <laughs> to get a bit. And I love, I love that. I love that phrase. <laughs> so I often describe this history as being very much alive. And, and I feel like you, you're on the same page that we're working to try to, to learn even more about Mary Lumpkin and her children and about your connection to them. Um, can you talk a little bit about what this means to your family, to or to you and to your family, to uncover this history and to learn to learn more about it? Like, why why is this important to you? Yes, and it's it's important to my extended family, and growing in importance. We have a Lumpkins family reunion every other year until COVID stopped it, and 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 I hope we can share some of the pictures of of all of us. There, there are about two hundred black. Admitting to be black <laughs> descendants, and you'll get get their pictures. And at first, it was like, oh, they call me Carol, not Carol. Libby. Oh, Carol, she's always working on stuff like that. And it's like, well, you know, this is kind of interesting. And then, you know, that makes sense. And you know, I I remember Grandma saying, and it's like growing, 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 growing. And right now, I have to say uh, something sad is happening in my family. My mother, who is the last of her generation. I went into hospice, home hospice, uh, about a week ago, and and uh, she do, she doesn't want resuscitation and, and dialysis and all that, and I care for her, but I have uh, I called in one of my Boston cousins to care for her while I'm here, because I was determined. I, I told you I'm going I'm going to come to this meeting today. I don't care what happens, and she's being 
Well, I want the story to go on. She's being cared for, would you believe this, by Mary Lumpkins, my cousin Mary Lumpkins, whose birthday is today. Hmm. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, uh, that, that, that I, uh, the point is, because of the sadness of the hospice and my mother, the family is gathering more. So they're coming over more and I'm sharing more and then reading more. And I'm sure, you see, I didn't put that piece of paper in there in, in Kristen's book. My family put it there. Somebody in the family, that, that piece of paper is where you talk about me and our family. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody comes in there and one, one will show it to the next and, and they're, they're, at, they're getting more and more interested, more and more excited. And, and it's like, oh, we really are part of the story of this country. Not just of ourselves, but this is a part of the story. There are two major African American families that go way back to before the Revolutionary War in Washington. They see the Quanders and the Proctors, and and we're he said we're not in that category, but they're starting yesterday for the first time. Did I do something wrong with my? Yeah, that's better. Okay, what am I doing? <laughs> I'm, I'm ruining the. the excuse me. <laughs> They were saying that that the idea that their family is not just important to us, but is an important part of the history of all of us is, is finally coming into their minds. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Let me ask you one last question and then we'll take audience questions. Um, you told us that you pretend that you were descended from Mary Lumpkin alone, meaning not from, from Robert Lumpkin. What does it mean? Yeah. What, what does it mean to be descended from Mary Lumpkin? First of all, it, it sounds like a magic fairy tale. We haven't even talked about Virginia Union University. Can you imagine somebody that our story is all tradition, so this is the same as the one that Kristen researched so well that an eight-year-old girl was given as a present to Robert Lumpkin. She had his first child when she was 13. She had five children by the time she was 22, 23, something like that. And when after the Civil War, and he had died, and she somehow inherited his money, which we could never figure out how that could happen. She managed to, she had enough resilience and enough refusal to give in to what slavery does to the mind to take the money and be the founder of a university. And, you know, I, I'm a novelist. If I wrote that to my editor at Random House, she'd tell me, you know, come on. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't happen. And it did happen. And we went there today. I just, it's just, you said, what does it mean? I couldn't have made it up. <laughs> that is, that is, that's, that's, that means she had resilience. She put up with all of that, all that rape and all of that misery and watching her fellow black people get hurt so badly in that jail and still was able to resist it. And she didn't cross over to, to, in her own mind to whiteness, if you know what I mean. To, to, I shouldn't say to whiteness, to white supremacy-ness. That's, that's what I really mean, but, but was, was resilient. And it was such, it really feels like, it feels not only am I proud of it, but it feels like my family <laughs> to, to me. We, we um, it always amazes me, I, I, and I, I'm, I'm sure to some of you as well, many, many, many white families didn't get to the United States till like 1900 or something. And we've been here three or 400 years and, and, and we've been here longer than they have, but, but, but they act like they're here first. <laughs> 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 but, 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 the, but, the, but the sense, the, the, the sense that, well, I don't know. I feel like I want to. Hear, I want to hear from you, and I, I'm taking up too much time. Let me shut up. No. <laughs> but, but, well, we're happy to take your questions yeah, now. Yeah, it. it's, it's here from you. Joseph's gonna. Yeah, for anyone who would like to ask a question, um, feel free just to raise your hand. Both myself and Sam will come around and get folks who uh, would like to ask. So here we are. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I'm also curious where your Jewish roots come from. Let's pick up, pick up the other book. Oh, we handed you. They come from, also come through Virginia. Uh, my 
great grandmother Olivia was a free woman here in in Portsmouth, Virginia. Excuse me, and she had she was descended five hundred years, uh, kicked out of Spain in fourteen ninety two. Go went from Spain to Portugal to Italy, was captured by the Barbary pirates, taken to Tripoli. And this book, this children's book tells that story of I went to visit my great grandmother, Olivia. This is on my father's side now. All, everything so far has been my mother's side. This is my father's side. And I asked her what it was like when she was 12 years old to be free because she was 12 years old when slavery ended. She said, don't you know we were never slaves except back in Egypt? And then she started telling the story that I'm telling you now. And the name Olivia has been passed down 500 years. Olivia, and the Jewish form of that is Shulamit, Shalom, peace. Olivia, Olive Branch, peace. So it's either Olivia or Shulamit, generation after generation. Shulamit, uh, but Asher or Oscar. My father's name is Oscar. And Asher is the... Hebrew word and Oscar is the way we use to hide it from people, you know, you have to hide. So that, that, it goes on, of course. I know that you did say um, it was difficult or it was hard to find out how she managed to inherit that property. In yes. That's something I, was hoping that you could share some more insight on. I think actually Kristen could help me more oh. than more than I because I don't I don't understand how how an, how an enslaved woman inherits property. Well, she wasn't enslaved anymore. The war was over. The war was over, but how? But, but she wasn't the wife. Was she married? It was or? left. It was left in her name. Yeah, it was left to her in her name. Woman had power. It, <laughs> yeah. So she inherited the entire property and their children were also all named in the will. And so that's how, that's the proof that I have that they are their children together. He named them. Um, he named her and did not refer to her as a wife and, um, and then named the five children. So that's how we know, like that's the, the proof of who, you know, the, this, fam this is a family. Not a family. I'm sorry. That's not the right term. But this is a, this is the proof that we have uh, that these five children were born to Mary Lumpkin and that Robert Lumpkin was the father. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, thank you both so much. Uh, I have a question for you uh, about being at that space again today, being down at Chaco Bottom. I didn't go there today. I didn't but, go today, but I, but I did go. Uh, in 2014. And I went last year. Last year. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear just a little more of how, you know, what you felt there and also your thoughts about what is being discussed about what they're going to do with that space and perhaps making a museum here. If you're involved in that and your thoughts about that. Yes. Yes. Well, 2014, I, as I said, I, I, I after I gave my talk on nappy hair, I, I don't even know who it was. If, if you're out there, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> who said? I know she. She probably regretted it. She took me. To, she took me to Chaco Bottom, and when I, when I, after I read the, the notices and looked at the, looked at that slave trail, and then went up to where it says Lumpkin's Jail. I, 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 I'm mystical a little bit. I felt them calling me, and I flopped down on the ground, and I, I wanted them to know that I had come. That that. They didn't get all of us, and then somebody had come through, and and I was whispering to them through the grass that that the story would have to be to me that that confirmed it that 2014 that confirmed it for me, and and I don't really remember I didn't have a, I took lots of pictures, but it never occurred to me to get a picture of me there because I wasn't about me, so I don't have a picture of me there. I have a picture of the grass, and I actually use it as a background on my Zoom where I teach at Howard. I have it as a background. I teach a course called Hell in High Water, and and uh, the devil hell, you know, uh, and that's a part of part of the story that I tell. And as for the, I, I'm not directly involved in, in what's happening there, but I have some hopes for it, for the museum there. I hope I, I hope somebody, somebody, okay, if you're out there, ask me. <laughs> I would love to be a part of it. I also have some more 
small parts of the stories of what happened to, to other members of the, the family and what happened to them. My dear, the, the, the wife of George Rowena is one of those bodies that was buried in, in Brooklyn and in the Harmony, Harmony Cemetery, whose body was flung back into the Virginia, into the Potomac River. You, you, some of you may know that story where, where the tombstones and all were de desecrated of these black people. That's what she just thinks. She spent her whole life trying to get away from Virginia <laughs> and got thrown back into, into the water uh, and, and ended up or dust on, on the Virginia shore. Yes, I, Virginia is a touchstone for me. I, I feel like if I, if I could make peace with Virginia, and you were part of that, of course, then, then, uh, then I can ask my, my uh, beloved uh, Israelis to try to make peace with my beloved Palestinians. Mm -hmm. so, Someone else with a question back on this side, does it look right? Oh, I have Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been to the Ohio, and I've never been to Ohio, but my son lives there now, so I'm going. And I wondered if you knew what part of Ohio that one section where the, the cemetery or... Yes, it's where, called New Richmond. No. <laughs> I mean, you can, like... like Dr. Haran said, it's like you couldn't write that. Yes, she write would it. end up spending 30 years of her life in a place that's named for Richmond. Um, but it's a little town on the Ohio River that's southwest of Cincinnati. Yeah, it's a really cute little riverfront town. It's kind of, time has kind of forgotten, but um, yeah. And she lives on a, she lives, she is buried on a, a very steep hill on the way into town. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, and I, I have been invited by Brenda Hayes, who's doing the film about about Marianne Numpkin, to go there. They, they want to take me there and get pictures of me at the grave, but I've never been there myself. Are there any other questions? Thank you both very much. Um, I was wondering if either of you wanted to comment on the book, Yellow Wife. Oh, I, I don't know if you've read it. I read it and I think that it's wonderful that Mary Lumpkin's story is being shared in, in a variety of uh, ways. And so I'm, I'm really excited about anything that gets people excited about this history. And I own it and haven't read it. That's very hard. Uh, as much as I, I love Christian's work, and, and I, I dip in it, I get mad. I have to put on my... Because <laughs> I get upset. But 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 I, I, I'm with you. I, as, long as, as long as it's labeled fiction and not history, I, I, I like to, get to, to admit to their categories. I, I'm fine with that. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a movie. Who's making the movie? And I just mentioned her name. Is anybody here who's, who's related, connected to that movie? Brenda Hayes. There's somebody there. Are you? Yeah. Can you talk? Can you share? <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's not a movie. It's a. It's a documentary. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I spoke with Brenda yesterday and today and the goal is to premiere that documentary here in richmond in um, february or march we are in the process of of um sort of finalizing uh, a date for it to premiere here in richmond so all of that sort of came together uh today or yesterday and Dr. Haran, this is Reverend Turner. Oh, Casey, uh, I can't Virginia. see. Oh. <laughs> oh, it's good to see you again. So, you. so it is in the works mm -hmm. and it will premiere here in Richmond. And we're going to get you on that board. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you both so much. Um, and I moved here from Tacoma Park, so I oh. listened to Epic City on WWD. All right. That's um, my radio show, everybody. That's right. <laughs> and, and you can go to WWD and, uh, and tune in. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, you're a classicist. I yes. know that. Um, and I wonder if you see some strains of your own story and your family's story uh, and see see the the journey that is depicted in other tales. Uh, Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I wonder if you if you have just something that comes to your mind about that. Well, the problem is I see everything as epic. <laughs> <laughs> you you, you, you got to catch me to try to find out what, what's not epic. But, but yes, I, I feel that I walk through the world and, I, and I, I see all the myths and epics walking before me in the people's faces and so forth. And certainly in my, in my own story, uh, in terms of, of uh, the, the story of Marianne Lumpkin, it, it, was, it was a surprise how it's come to me, but not a surprise in that it exists. I, I has been the one of the wishes of my life was the three moments in history that I wanted that's I wish I were, were alive then kind of thing. And one is when when somebody who was supposed to memorize the, the Iliad was too stupid to memorize it and, and had to write it down. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have this vision of this poor poor dumb poet hiding behind a rock writing. <laughs> And don't you know you're supposed to say it orally? You didn't know that. So that's the first moment. The second, the second is Gutenberg, a uh, movable type. When the words got to, got to more people because of movable type, and and I and I always said I wish I hope I could be alive the third time. And I believe this is that third time with the internet and with hip hop. Believe it or not, I, I, I'm called one of my nicknames is the grandmother of hip hop because in spite of maybe not agreeing with all the all all the lyrics, if you will. Uh, I see that oral poetry as another way, another moment in the history of disseminating the stories of people. And I, I feel that like my story is a part of that call and response that, that's going forth. If, if without call and response, we wouldn't have it here. And, and, I, I, and I see call and response as the greatest gift of Africa to the world. As far as I know, Nappy Hair is the only book that's with 100% in call and response. Even today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I believe we have one last question, correct? Sorry. I always enjoy being last. It's such a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> um, this this is a question more to you, but it, either of you can answer if so desire. You talked about a while back how you kind of caught the story in bits and pieces as a nine-year-old as it wasn't a story you would tell a nine-year-old. But how, if you could, how would you tell it to a child? How would I tell it to a child? Well, I'm actually working on that. <laughs> and I, I had hoped to write at least one children's book for each one of my heritages if, that I could find out about. And, uh, and this Dappy Hair is, of course, Africa. And always in Olivia is my Jewish story, and and I've just received a, as I as I mentioned, a, a grant from Theater J to tell my family story. Theater J is a Jewish theater, but they they're it's called expanding the canon, in which they're trying to get more Jewish stories that are not just about Eastern European Jews. So I plan to I plan to tell it so the children can go to the theater and see this. You say, how would I do it? I don't know, but I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> uh, hey, look, if I could teach, I, I taught the Iliad to five-year-olds, so I can figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> this is more or less a statement um, when you talk about the sex. I recently read the Hemises, and it's understood that Sally Hemmings had the same effect on Thomas Jefferson mm -hmm. for her kids mm -hmm. as Mary Ann Lumpkins did. So there is power in that, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I think there's a, pro there's a problem sometimes in accepting it, that, that, that the people can have that kind of power. Essentially, uh, 
I guess I would say rooted in, in the body and sexual attraction of some kind. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know it for myself. <laughs> <laughs> but somebody's got it. <laughs> oh, what an ending. <laughs> Thank you both, uh, <laughs> Kristen Green and Dr. Carol Olivia Harad. Mm -hmm. Can we get one more round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Here today, we hope will continue to be shared. Um, the importance of this is not just keeping it in this room. The importance of this story is to share it widely, share it broadly, and share it with those you love, and to share it with those you might not love so much, right? Because <laughs> everybody's got to hear the truth every now and again. And so I hope that this has helped inform all of you all. Uh, I hope that this has helped to, uh, empower you to share these stories and to search your own stories out as well, because this does not happen without us being willing to share with each other. It does not happen without us being able to come together and and to, to openly admit to a lot of the things that we might even feel difficult to tell. And so as we move from this space and in transition into our lovely reception, uh, we hope that you take that with you uh, and that you can share it widely and share it here if you would like. Um, thank you again for joining us today. Our reception will be in the Commonwealth Hall right outside. Uh, and so we look forward to doing the book signing out there, talking with Dr. Haran and uh, as well as Kristen. And so we look forward to seeing you and continuing these conversations. Thank you all. <laughs>